This is the first lecture in a series of lectures about measuring and interpreting functional connectivity in uh, neural time series data. Um, I want to start this uh, little um, section with a separate lecture that's not really about connectivity methods per se, um, but just about um, highlighting a few things related to connectivity that you should keep in mind. In particular, four things. These are not all necessarily like big problems or potential confounds that you need to worry about. Um, these are more things that you need to um, consider. These are points that you should keep in mind when you are doing connectivity analyses on your data or when you are um, interpreting connectivity results that you see in papers or in talks or whatever. Um, so here's the four. Uh, the first one is bivariate versus multivariate interactions. Now, um, here is uh, a picture of the brain. Um, when really inside the brain, you know, there's like all these different um, parts of the brain and different subregions of the brain, different columns, different types of neurons. And there's really rich, complicated, dynamic patterns of connectivity at all these different spatial and temporal scales. Um, so it's a very um, chaotic system. It's a very rich and dynamical system. We have um, uh, unidirectional uh, connectivity and bidirectional connectivity. And there's also evidence that some patterns of um, connectivity are actually just serving to modulate other patterns of connectivity between different areas. So there's all sorts of like rich, complicated things. Um, but usually when we analyze connectivity in our data, we typically do something like this. So we just look for connectivity between uh, one pair or uh, a different pair of brain regions or electrodes, you know, or, or however you're setting up the analysis. So this would be an example of multivariate interactions, um, but here now we often measure uh, connectivity in terms of bivariate connections. So you can see, and obviously this drawing is even an enormous uh, simplification, um, and this is an even further simplification. So uh, yeah, this in some cases can be problematic, um, particularly if you want to make interpretations about directionality. I'll talk about that more in a few minutes. Mostly, you know, this isn't really a problem, I think, per se. It's just something to keep in mind that, you know, there, there are myriad uh, really complicated things happening inside the brain. And what we typically measure is a tiny subset of simplistic things because this is sort of um, easier to analyze and easier to interpret, easier to relate back to the cognitive process that you're studying um, or whatever. Um, certainly people are trying to do these kinds of multivariate um, interactions, and if you're looking to do these, then I certainly encourage you to uh, to um, make a valiant effort to try and uncover all these dynamics. The, the, the problem here really becomes that um, uh, the, the models, models with this many parameters start requiring um, a huge amount of data to uh, to get reasonable fits to the data and get reasonable parameter estimates. Um, and at some point you get these very higher order interactions and you don't really even know how to interpret the results. And so that's why people often stick to these um, more kind of constrained and simple bivariate um, connectivity approaches. And I think if these are uh, well constrained by your experiment, by the cognitive dynamics that you're studying, then, uh, then this is often a very good way to, um, to go. I think this is a very successful approach looking at bivariate interactions, interactions. And I think there's a good reason why most of connectivity analyses in the literature are focused on bivariate interactions as opposed to multivariate interactions. Nonetheless, something to keep in mind when doing your analyses. <clears throat> um, the next point is actually a um, potential concern for connectivity analyses, and that is the issue of volume conduction. Um, this issue has already come up, uh, in particular in the lecture on the Laplacian. And here, um, the sort of feature of EEG measurements and MEG is that a single source in the brain will project to the activity that you can record from many or sometimes even all electrodes. This is um, fine for just looking at EEG activity, um, but if you want to do connectivity analyses, this can be a significant um, uh, confound because if you if you observe very strong connectivity between these electrodes, 
it could actually be that these that the connectivity is artifactually high it's not really connectivity it's just that you're measuring the same source from both electrodes so this is a potential um, uh, confound here's just a different way of looking at it this is what you would really like <clears throat> that um, two different electrodes measure two different parts of the brain so when you measure connectivity between these two electrodes that's actually reflecting connectivity between these two parts of the brain this is you know the sort of ideal situation that we would like unfortunately these two things happen um, well in addition to this these these things are kind of all mixed together um, we have the same source projecting to multiple um, electrodes this happens with EEG and MEG with EEG you have an additional concern which is that a single source can project to um, two electrodes not only um, by volume conduction through these different tissues but also through this sort of <clears throat> uh, lateral spread of the uh, electrical current and particularly in the borders um, between the different uh, tissue types that have different uh, conductivities. Okay, so these three situations are kind of mixed together. Um, and so um, the reason why this is problematic is because if you see a connectivity result between two electrodes, uh, you don't know to what extent the situation reflects this or the situation reflects these. Um, so one approach, a good approach, um, which I and many other people um, uh, recommend, is to use the Laplacian if you're conducting um, computing connectivity analyses at the at the electrode level to first apply the Laplacian um, to your data in order to um, minimize the um, the potential volume conduction artifacts. Um, so and now <laughs> this is a little bit idealized, right? It's not exactly this beautiful that after the Laplacian each electrode measures the activity from a patch of cortex directly underlying that electrode. So it's not entirely true, but this is a better sort of approximation of what's going on compared to um, you know this this thing here, which would be the situation before you apply the Laplacian. Um, so here we see um, uh, an example of a topographical map before and after applying the Laplacian. Um, and what you see is that a lot of these low spatial frequencies have been removed from the data. Um, and so you get a much higher uh, spatial precision information. And after applying the Laplacian, uh, the artifactual connectivity between electrodes because of volume conduction is very strongly attenuated. Um, now, the word attenuated here is important because you can never really be totally confident that you've eliminated 100% the volume conduction artifact. Um, but it can be very strongly attenuated. In my book, in chapter, I'm not even going to guess the number because I'll probably guess it wrong and it'll be in this video forever. Um, in the first chapter that deals with uh, connectivity in the section on connectivity, I outline um, four different uh, predictions that uh, volume conduction would make. If you have a volume conduction artifact, there are four different predictions uh, that it would make for your results. Um, and um, I also list 10 different strategies for how to make sure your um, connectivity results are not uh, influence or driven by volume conduction. So if you're doing these kinds of analyses, then I encourage you to look through those. Basically, you want to make sure that at least one or preferably several of these four predictions are fail to be confirmed in your data, which provides evidence against um, the volume conduction accounting for your um, for your connectivity results. Um, and then you can go through several of the 10 um, possible um, mitigating strategies, one of which is to apply the Laplacian. Okay, um, another um, thing to keep in mind about connectivity is that connectivity can be um, computed, most measures of connectivity can be computed either over time or over trials. <clears throat> so here I have a graph uh, that illustrates this idea conceptually. So imagine that um, each one of these lines corresponds to a trial, so this is time. Um, and each of these are trials. So here we have, you know, two, four, six, eight trials. Um, and now we can compute connectivity. And so this is actually the difference in phase values between two electrodes. Well, I'll talk about what this means and why we assume that this is 
uh, a measure of connectivity in the near future. Um, but anyway, so here we can compute connectivity either um, within a single trial over time, and this would be called connectivity over time, or we can compute um, the, the connectivity uh, estimate at this single time point over trials, and this would be connectivity over trials. Um, so either of these two methods is fine. They have slightly different assumptions, slightly different interpretations. Um, for example, here you get an estimate of connectivity per trial. So maybe that's useful. You would get, actually for this situation, over eight trials, you would get eight different estimates of connectivity. Presumably, if you know if there's true connectivity in the in the brain here that you're measuring, then these eight numbers would would you know tell you basically the same thing. Um, but still, here you would get eight different values corresponding to eight different trials. Here you get one connectivity estimate per time point, and that's a measure of the average connectivity at that time point over all these trials. So this measure, connectivity over time, has um, gives you some temporal uh, uh, resolution, um, but it has relatively low, uh, I'm sorry, trial resolution is what I meant to say. It has relatively low uh, temporal precision because you get one estimate of connectivity over a pretty big window of time. And depending on what frequency you want to um, analyze, that window of time might be pretty significant. It might you know, maybe like a second or over a second. So you lose some temporal precision, but you gain, you know, trial uh, resolution. And here, connectivity over trials is uh, maximizing your, your temporal precision. So you get an estimate of connectivity, you know, per uh, time point. Of course, because of time frequency decomposition and uh, temporal smearing, this is actually not really instantaneous at this millisecond. It reflects a window from surrounding um, time points. But still, this is certainly much higher um, temporal precision than what you would get with this kind of an analysis over time. On the other hand, uh, this kind you know, measuring connectivity over trials you don't get an, a separate estimate of connectivity per trial. So if you wanted to do some kind of trial-based analysis or single trial analyses, that's really not possible to do using connectivity over trials, unless you know you, you bin the trials into you know some number of small number of bins according to I don't know reaction time or um, stimulus uh, condition or something like that. So nearly all. Um, methods of connectivity can be implemented either over time or over trials. Um, they give you slightly different um, opportunities for what to do with your data, slightly different interpretations, slightly different assumptions um, in terms of uh, requirements for you know how much time versus how many trials you will need. Um, and so yeah, this is just something to uh, keep in mind. Um, the last point is um, considering the, the distinction between directional connectivity and non-directional connectivity. We could also call this symmetric versus asymmetric connectivity. I don't know why I wrote directional versus symmetric. It should be directional, non-directional, or asymmetric versus symmetric, but whatever. Um, this is very simple. So we have a picture like this where we are estimating the connectivity flowing from this region to this region. And so the arrow is going this way. This is directional, obviously. This is the opposite direction. So we can have completely different results for this analysis versus this analysis. This would be directional or asymmetric connectivity. Um, or we can just measure um, the, the non-directional or the symmetrical connectivity. Um, and here we get one estimate for connectivity between these two regions, and we're not making any um, claims or inferences about uh, the directional flow. So you may be wondering, why would anyone want to do this non-directional connectivity when this is so much more interesting? So uh, it's, a de it's a fair question, but I think the answer really comes down to um, kind of uh, pragmatics that um, estimating, you know, trying to uh, disentangle these two directions of connectivity is not as easy as you might think it should be. It's it's actually a difficult problem, particularly when there's noise in the data. Um, if if different electrodes are measuring uh, um, sources with different distances away from the electrodes, then just the the distances um, 
or the amplitudes of the signals can be uh, confounding and uh, can be a source of confound in this analysis. And also fitting these types of models generally uh, requires more, um, uh, more data in order to fit these models. So in practice, um, I think I would say the majority of people who do connectivity analyses use uh, or focus on symmetric uh, connectivity analyses or non-directional analyses, um, mainly for reasons of, um, of uh, yeah, well, I was going to say simplicity, but I mean, you know, accuracy of fitting the model because models that make this kind of uh, assumption are um, just easier to fit. They're higher signal to noise and they're more um, trustworthy compared to these kinds of models. Part of the reason why directional connectivity is difficult to measure in the brain is because it, this actually taps back into the bivariate versus multivariate issue a bit. So, you know, here we're just measuring um, uh, two, uh, two sort of hubs in here in, in the brain, two, two nodes. Um, but in reality, so it's difficult to measure connectivity between two nodes when we know that there's a lot of other stuff happening everywhere else in the brain. Um, so here is two examples of this problem. We can have the common input problem, and you're only, let's say you're only measuring uh, nodes A and B in the brain, so brain region A and brain region B. And let's say you find a, a lag between them of 20 milliseconds, so you say, well, that means that A drives B, so we have evidence for directional coupling from A to B. But it actually could be that uh, region C is uh, driving both of these. And in fact, maybe A and B aren't even connected to each other at all. Um, so, but, but then, you know, C drives A uh, with a short lag and C drives B with a slightly <laughs> circuitous route and a longer lag. And then you would measure connectivity between these. So this is uh, one example of, uh, of uh, difficulty with measuring or, or interpreting directional connectivity. Um, and then we have this thing called the who's first problem. Um, and that's where if you see, particularly if, if you have dynamics that are, um, that are oscillatory, that have a sort of rhythmic component, it's difficult to disentangle uh, the directionality purely based on the lag. Because if you say that there's some time lag between these two, you don't necessarily know whether A is driving B with a lag of 10 milliseconds or whether B is driving A with a lag of... 56 milliseconds. I don't remember why I chose these numbers, but um, uh, so this is another problem. The, in general, the best way to um, to apply directional connectivity analyses, like Granger, for example, um, is to have a well-designed experiment where you can do a nice condition comparison and then interpret differences in directionality or changes in directionality um, as a function of uh, different conditions. Uh, and different task demands, different cognitive processing. If that can make sense in the context of your, um, of, of, you know, the sort of theory of what's happening in the brain at that time, uh, in that, uh, during that cognitive process, then directional connectivity can be a very useful and informative method. Um, where directional connectivity is most difficult to interpret is in um, uh, sort of very open exploratory analyses where you don't really have a good grasp on which directions should be present to what extent between different which areas and so on. Okay, um, so I hope you found that uh, um, interesting. Um, and uh, again, these are points that, that will come up over and over again as we discuss more of the like nitty gritty details of doing connectivity analyses. But these are just some points that you should always keep in mind when doing connectivity analyses or when um, evaluating other people's connectivity analyses.